and welcome to Dungeons and Drama Nerds, a podcast exploring the intersection of theater and tabletop role-playing games. I'm Nick, here today with Percy. Hello. And ensemble members, Ben. I hate actual play. And Chris. I love actual play. And as you can tell, we've got both, all, every possible angle on today's topic uh, covered in depth and nuance. Uh, today we're here with another episode of our Dark Time series, uh between actual play campaigns and we're going to be discussing tabletop role-playing game actual plays how actual play shows can create entry points to playing tabletop role-playing games and the extent to which they can function as ways of teaching games it's all going to be very meta we're an actual play talking about actual plays but i think it's going to be i think it's going to be a good time i'm excited to find out where we go to kick us off, let's kind of go around and can everybody just tell me a little bit about your personal relationship to actual plays? Ben, do you want to start? I'm happy to start. Um, you know, it, it's fun. I in our little document where we have our notes for this episode, I um I read all of yours because I wrote mine last, and um I was surprised that nobody said that their intro to effectively actual play was, I cast magic missile. I'm attacking the darkness because. I think that's a sketch that, like, everyone has heard. You, you've all heard this, right? No. Yes. I cast per magic per missile Percy at the darkness. Too young. Um, <laughs> what's, what's this from? It's, a, it's like a 1990s, like, sketch comedy, uh, like, audio that mm. then, like, sort of resurfaced every couple years for, like, 10 years. Um, oh, I, I truly know. It was like a pre YouTube uh, sketch uh, where basically okay. it's making fun of people playing D and D, and it's there's a guy who's a wizard who's like, "I cast magic missile." There's nothing to cast magic missile at. I cast it at the darkness. Incredible. That's good. Um, this was a that. part of my my internet upbringing. Yes. Yeah. If you if you haven't if, listeners, if you haven't heard it, it's it's the Dead Ale Wives. It's from the 1990s. I'll put, I'll put it in the show notes and I'll watch um, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. very long. Yeah, it's it's, it's that. that like long form pr like internet comedy, which it does Whoa. not work uh, time wise anymore. But anyway, so like I think we've also all watched Stranger Things, which yes. funny enough was a show where you know they played D and D on it for a couple, you know, like one scene per season. But it started in twenty sixteen, and that was also around sort of the the actual play like becoming a big genre moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think after Critical Role around the time of the adventure zone um which that's just that's just funny um i think the first thing that i listened to that was actually actual play and not you know uh, sort of a uh, slightly fictionalized version of playing a role-playing game or specific dnd &D &D, was um the the podcast chapo trap house which i'm certain uh many of you listen to uh did a uh, a series called tabletop game theory uh back in i think it was 2017 uh so it was like early days i uh, remember chapo tabletop gm'd game by virgil texas uh who's dead now he's no longer alive he's alive His memory he just, be a blessing he disappeared um uh, <laughs> And then I think the um sort of the, the, the first like thing I listened to it that was a whole season was The Adventure Zone, which was like what, twenty fifteen to seventeen. I, I, I hopped on like at the end of their uh balance series. Um that sort of took me through, uh, you know, as more and more people I liked were making it. So, you know, like Branson, Reese, Chris Hastings, uh, and that whole crew made Root Tales of Magic. Um, that company also did um, Fun City, which was uh, a shadow, which is a shadow run one, GM'd by Mike Rignetta, who was someone who I just like. Um, and that sort of, you know, I listened to a bunch of other shit. Um, like Neo Scum is Wonderful, also Shadowrun. Uh, I listened to a couple other Shadowrun actual plays because I like Shadowrun because I uh, hate myself. Um, and, uh, you know, things like the One Shot podcast. Sometimes you go in, you're interested in a system, and they play two episodes of it. Um, and, you know, a couple years after I started listening to this stuff, you know, in, in 2020, um, I guess like three or four years after I started listening to it, uh, I actually did it on um, a show you might have heard of called uh, Dungeons and Drama Nerds. Uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if you can find that one. Uh, it's it's really hard to find. <laughs> you you cannot find that one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's like in your uh, podcast app right now. Uh, if it is, how how it is? Don't start with the D and D. So, don't start with a DND unless you want to be like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> who the fuck is this DMing it? Yeah, unless you want to be like, unless you want to be like, what's up with that mouse? What that mouse doing? Um, 
that's what we wanted to know. Yeah, it's, and then at the same time, it was Fun City, which is a Shadowrun actual play I listened to. They did a season, a uh, pandemic season, recorded remotely in a different game called Still Fleet, uh, which was a non-released game. Got very interested in it, so I joined that community, and now I'm like one of the official people who does streams with them. So that's also like another avenue that I've started performing in actual play. Um, yeah, that's long-winded say- way of saying this is a genre that I think has existed for a long time in various forms, but then in 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 its current format, about you know eight years. I was thinking about this um, because the easy answer is I'm an OG critter from episode six of the first campaign. But I think the reason why I knew anything about that was because uh, that all kind of happened at a time in my life when I was, you know, in between sort of gigs and I had a lot of time and I started to watch Will Wheaton's Tabletop, which I would actually characterize as an actual play. It's just not TTRPGs. They're just like, it's a board game, right? It'll be like Munchkin or like, you know, Betrayal at House on the Hill or Ticket to Ride or whatever, what have you. Um, Munchkin being basically so, D&D. Say that again. Munchkin being basically D and D. Ticket to Ride was basically D and D, and I was like, if D and D had more trains in it, I would play so much more than I. Hey, do you did a great job with those storylines. You should go to Eberron. It's so true. Yeah. Anyway, I'm well, sorry. anyway, but I think that's where it came from, and I, and I was, I, I think, as a theater maker and as a dramaturg and a, and a director, um, and a neurodivergent person, um, I'm very interested in rules and social rules and constructs and things and like social engagement stuff. So. I found myself getting rather interested in this sort of like, you know, I just always liked games and stuff. It was a fun way to pass the time. And then, but when Critical Role happened, I was like, oh, oh, this is theater. I understood instantly. I was like, there's a very interesting transference of sort of like narrative uh, agency between two parties of dungeon master and player and like this passing of the torch back and forth, like performance for one another. And that has a lot to do with the fact that they are performers and performing for themselves. And that, especially at least in the beginning of the game, I think it is pretty safe to say that it was their home. It was actually their home game at the beginning because they didn't know any better at the time. Um, and that is just how they are as people that they like to perform for one another, right? So it like instantly caught my theatrical attention, um, and I was hooked on a lot of it. And I also then and then I got into the balance of, uh, arc of the adventure zone pretty early on, um, and then eventually you know dimension twenty and all the other ones too right I was like a, you know I, I just got into all those things and then well before that was the bridge too far for me as a nerd for a long time was D and D and then once I saw sort of how five E functioned I was like oh no no this is actually deeply deeply my like aesthetic and storytelling shit do you know what i mean so uh so yeah in a nutshell that's i've i've watched a ton ever ever since then um and it'll be interesting to talk about later but like what keeps me from watching what what grabs me and what holds me and what doesn't i think that's also interesting stuff but more or less that's that's me cool yeah i'll i can talk about my like personal arc a little bit which is I think inter- I, I think mine is a little bit of a weird one, but I'm not sure. Um, so my first exposure to actual play was way back in, I think it was like 2008 or something like that, and was a, a promotional podcast um, when podcasts were barely a thing that Wizards of the Coast did with the, the like people from Penny Arcade, whose yeah. names I'm forgetting, but you know, the, the two dudes from Penny Arcade. And Three at third- the time. Yeah, well, I was gonna say I don't think he was ever Penny Arcade. Echo like... and Gabe, is that their names? So yeah, Gabe is one of them. I don't remember. I haven't paid attention to Penny Arcade since I stopped sure, being a teenager sure. in the aughts. Um... Positions Incorporated. They were almost yes. as good as uh, Control Alt Delete, which uh, has given us one of our great cultural touchstones in loss. <laughs> I I don't know that part I... as well. This is uh, we can't ex- we can't explain the loss meme right now. Please continue, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, as I think as Chris mentioned, Acquisitions Incorporated, uh, which I'm pretty sure is still going yeah. inexplicably, much like Penny Arcade. Um, uh, 
but that was my sort of first that was that was a promotional thing for the start of the launch of fourth edition D D, which was also my kind of intro to dungeons and dragons and tabletop role-playing games generally um and that was very much a how not quite a how to play thing but it was like we are launching this podcast to showcase like how you play this new edition of D D. you can hear them talk about it very deliberately on the podcast where, you know, one of them had played third edition and would keep being Jerry. like, okay, but yes, I think so. I think that's right. Uh, and, and, you know, it would be like, okay, but like, how do you do this thing now? And Chris Perkins or whoever would explain it. Um, yeah. Um, and then I kind of, I, I, I kind of didn't listen to a lot of TND actual plays for a lot of, for a while. Um, and dipped back into them after college when I discovered a bunch that I, I no longer remember because they were sort of pre the actual play boom and are, in fact, just a bunch of people with, like, one microphone in the middle of a table recording their home game, which is uh, unlistenable in in many cases. Um, but, I, but over the years, I've dipped into a lot of them... Um, uh, I, I really like the Magpies, which is a Blades in the Dark campaign by Clever Corvid Productions. I, I, right now, I'm really enjoying uh, Path. Uh, excuse me, I'm really enjoying Tabletop Gold, which is a Pathfinder campaign. The Lost Mountain, which features I don't know how to pronounce it, Basin, Basin, the the Norway the the Scandinavian role playing <laughs> horror role playing game. How's, how's it spelled? V a e s e n. Nathan. There we go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that <laughs> accurate <laughs> pronunciation, Ben. Um, and Friends at the Table is one I've dipped into a lot and is my perennial, like, I should like this. Um, I should love this. And I love many parts of it, and somehow I can never stick with it. And I don't know what that is for me. Um, I like all the kind of people i like the kind of creativity and the world building they do i just can't um dig into it uh i don't know what that is but it's but it's very good and if you're interested in that sort of um they i think they build themselves as a t ttrpg podcast about critical world building and they do have a lot of kind of fun um thought-provoking or at least sort of vaguely you know like progressive thoughtful bits of world building that they do in their various settings and they play many different games which i think is always interesting um i will say the one thing that is one of the things i think is odd about me is that they are all uh podcasts i've never been able to really watch a streamed uh campaign um I think maybe that just has to do with how I like consume visual media, i.e. I can't do anything else while I do it, um, which makes it hard to watch a like four hour critical role <laughs> video. Uh, but yeah, that's me. And that's my weird 16 year long history with actual play. What about you, Percy? Um, yeah, I I started playing D&D &D when I was um, like a preteen at Girl Scout camp because I didn't like being outside. <laughs> um, so I would, I would DM for all of the other girls who did not want to go outside <laughs> at Girl Scout camp. So like I started playing D&D then. But um, I, Taz Balance, um, which like my boyfriend at the time like recommended to me when I, I don't know, in like 2015, 2016-ish. Um, that, that was my entry point to like, it introduced me to 5th edition and very, I think, significantly maybe for later in our conversation, um, I felt like I was learning it alongside the McElroy brothers um, yeah. and that was really accessible to me because like they didn't know what the fuck they were doing and I was like did they did they ever learn what how to play that game no I would argue they did no, I, would, I would argue they got uh, to a point where they did and then they then they then they conveniently forgot they regressed severely <laughs> and that well yeah now they think they do <laughs> um, yeah. but it was it was like uh, it, it felt really nice to it it felt like they were earnestly trying to learn how to play the game but also like it was nice to have the breath like the freedom of like I, my wizard's name is fucking taco and you know whatever whatever um i'm a flip, I'm a flip wizard <laughs> oh shit sweet flips um uh, but taz balance is my entry point to tabletop actual play shows um 
I'm a huge consumer of actual play now. I like I have Chris's video habits and Ben's podcast habits. Like the three of us have a ton of overlap. Um, I'm also a critter because of Chris Dirksen. Um, I've seen every season of Dimension Twenty. Uh, some multiple times. Um, I've listened to some uh, not another D and D podcast, which is uh, uh, Emily Axford and Brian Murphy from Dimension Twenty. Um, and some college humor folks. Um, I listen to Retails of Magic. Uh, oh, these are the stars of base, which is produced by the same people. Some one shot, but again, I drop in only for like systems that I'm interested in, and then kind of drop out. Um, I listen to Worlds Beyond Number, which is uh, by Abri Iyengar, Eric Ishii, Lou Wilson, and uh, Brendan Lee Mulligan. Um, I listen to some smaller shows, but I have hit my capacity because I'm also a big audio fiction person. Um, so I listen to a ton of audio fiction, and there is only so much time in the day that you can listen to podcasts, unfortunately. Um, I have also started doing some more like actual play performance recently, which has been kind of fun and cool. Um, shout out to Friend of the Pod, Moon Harbor Heroes. Um, but I weirdly I never get asked to play D and D on actual play shows, which is really funny to me. <laughs> um, same. That is same. Arguably, the, well, part of it is because we don't do D and D. We did once. We did once and never again. Well, um, I think that's the format of the show too. Why would you yeah. do a game a second time unless you're going to do the Brindlewood Bay 9/11 special? <laughs> that's the <laughs> one exception. <laughs> Um. <laughs> is that the first time I've yeah. mentioned that on mic? Um, it might be. <laughs> hey, fans, if you want to hear a Brindlewood Bay 9-11 special, please let Email us know. Email ben.ferber. <laughs> <laughs> Join us ben. on Patreon, and maybe we'll record and release a, a Brindlewood I, Bay I was going to say, the Brindlewood Bay 9-11 special will be like, <laughs> when we decide we're shutting down shop. That will be also going, <laughs> And also no longer interested in having any public-facing life whatsoever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Ben is here for. Ben is our sort of ripcord for when we decide to sort of uh, yeah, it's true. end it all. Anyway, um, yeah, that's Happy my... That. Th- anyway, yeah, th- my mine is basically similar to all of y'all's. Um, I mostly turn to actual play for, like, entertainment purposes. Um, it is, like, my main source of, like, if I want to watch something or listen to something on the train or whatever, I will put on actual play um, or, like, audio fiction um, is my go-to. Um, but my that leads me into sort of a broader question that I think is good for discussion as we sort of move on to this grounding of like where are we all coming from and what do we all know and what are the shows that we're sort of conversant in, uh, which is like what do we turn to actual plays for? Like what is the po- what what do we what is the point of our engagement with them? What are we looking for out of them? Um, because I think there are like two main things that have emerged, but I'm curious people's thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. The The entertainment aspect, I do a lot of listening to actual play while I uh, run in the mornings, while I fold laundry, while I do dishes, sort of the like. And I think this is, again, I mentioned I like can't watch actual play. And I think this is like, for me, it is the sort of thing that I really enjoy tuning into with about one half-ish of my brain. Um because in a lot of actual play shows, you know, it's like, I'm invested, but also rarely is every word that's spoken uh, significant or struck in gold the way it might be in, like, an audiobook or something. Um, but I also listen to them, I found myself listening to them a lot when I am uh, picking up a new game or about to start running a game I haven't run before, because the more different systems I GM, the more I've come to appreciate how... Uh, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but, like, how different, I would say, the rhythm of different games are, or the, like, the flow, for lack of a better word, and that's the thing that I listen to actual play for a lot, is to try to get a sense of, like, what, you know, Blades in the Dark, the, 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 if, if, to borrow a phrase from Powered by the Apocalypse, the game is a conversation, the conversation in apocalypse world flows very differently than it does in dungeons and dragons and also very differently than it does in blades in the dark and so i listen in some ways not even for the rules as much as to kind of try to wrap my head around like what that pattern is the fundamental sort of like push and pull between the gm and the players Mm -hmm. hmm 
Yeah, I think the I think this is interesting because I think uh, I think to say that we listen to it for entertainment is like yes and you know yeah. like what it, what about it is entertaining is perhaps the thing that I'm thinking about and why right like why do why do I this is also just a conversation in general about audience that I think about with theater all the time, right? Like, you know, there's a certain element of, like, willing suspension of disbelief that that requires a certain, like, you got you to gotta put an investment into it, and you got to choose what you invest in. And there is an element in general of always having a little bit, you could always give a little more, you know what I mean? Like, you really could always give just a little more. Um, whether that's reasonable or not is sort of like up to the person. Um, but, and, and what turns people off is also like very, very different in, in these cases. For me, I think, I think the things that I've noticed is I prefer a visual medium to an audio medium myself. Um, I like the second screen viewing of it all, right? Like you're talking about, Nick, like the, I'm on my phone while I watch a thing. Or I think it's very good for that. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I also think it's very good for things like dishes, laundry, you know, the day-to-day, the -day, like, tasks that you got to get through. It sort of, like, give you sort of, like, a through-line narrative to, you know, have an adventure <laughs> while, you, while you fold your laundry. Um, but I also think it's very, it, it is very much about, like, for me, I love the intersection of mechanics and like sort of like improv, improvisational storytelling, and interpersonal storytelling. Um, so when the mechanics are clunky or the understanding of the mechanics are clunky, and we spend a whole lot of time going, "Wait, uh, what? Ooh, uh, a, hey, uh," versus like, I do this thing and it's narratively important because I know this game well enough to spin to like make it happen. Uh, and the room that 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 game is in, a lot of time it is the ensemble. All knows to accept it, right? And there's not like anybody being like um, actually about anything. Mm -hmm. Like those are the unless ones that fun. I really yeah lean into. Yeah, of course, unless it's unless it's fun, right? Like if you're if you're doing a, unless that um actually is sort of like knowingly doing it, and you know, uh, I think Dimension Twenty does a good job of having that um the um actually is. Right, mm -hmm. whereas like early Critical Role, Liam O'Brien was a little um actually too much in a way that was like, buddy, calm down, you know, like it's just, trying it's to play a game. game. Yeah, is that the guy they yeah. kicked off? No. Oh no, he that was, was a different guy. Yeah. That different guy. There was a lot. Okay, there was a lot there. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of real good reasons to do that. This <laughs> cool. is this is almost all I know about uh, Critical Role <laughs> is that there's a guy who was on the early <laughs> sessions that got kicked off, and no critter says his name. <laughs> I mean, I'll say him, Orion Akaba. I was gonna say, I don't know his name. I'll it's say never, it. Like, come up. <laughs> uh, he's in the sky. He's like three to, dots. They don't like to. To be fair, they don't like to talk about it because it's uh, he's a person, and yeah. they still, you know, and but like it was, and it was like real problems that he had. That it was yeah. like to sort of sensationalize it would be bad. So they've sort of, over many years, really kind of tried to put a moratorium on the conversation about it because. Uh, Listen, we've already talked about one person. disappeared actual player in this show, Virtual Texas. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, now this this is maybe pivoting the conversation a little bit, but another question that we've been thinking about, uh, and I I guess I I'm sure that a big part of it was what you just said, Chris, but it does also um, sort of the the we had to you know ask a guy to leave our game does also a little bit make murky the sort of meta narrative of like we're, f we're friends having fun hold on a second with that, that yeah. the, you're, you're you're acting as if that doesn't happen in home games too like it definitely does no it definitely also, does that that's what i'm saying to listen to i think it's fun when someone gets kicked off a show <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not saying it's fun, but 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 that is what I'm I saying, am. actually, Chris, is that the oh, the, the conceit of like ah, like we're just like we're just like playing this game is like yeah, some, like sometimes people behave shittily and you have to kick them out of your game, but that does not fit the sort of uh, the product the, of the kumbaya because yeah, that exactly. that is the phenomenon that I see all the time is that I think a lot of people 
and there's like growing criticism like i think the actual play like wave has sort of evolved past this point where more people mm-hmm. are oh, critical yeah. of this than, than do it but there was a time where like everybody was like this show is me and my friends having fun together and the product is like see how much fun we are we are having as our as friends at our home game table but Mm-hmm. The discourse, I think, very often reaches a point where you talk about shows like Critical Role or you talk about shows like The Adventure Zone, and it's like, okay, what's the point at which this is a product and a business? Well, for the McElroys, it was already a business because they were like already doing. They're already doing that. Yeah, they're already doing that. But I think Critical Role. Well, is but like... that show was originally them doing a couple episodes of D and D because they could record them all at once and release them rather than doing it week by week. Yeah. Because one of them was going to go on paternity leave for like a month. Totally. So like. Yeah. That was, in fact, a, like, it was a quote-unquote product, but it was also them, like, having fun doing the product in a yeah. cool experimental way where they're like, hopefully the fans will like this. And they did, so they kept doing the show. Yeah. But which is to say, I think Critical Role is the thing that people look at most often if they're looking at this phenomenon of, like, sure. what is the point at which it stops being a home game and becomes, like, a show TM? Um, and Once you get adapted it... into an Amazon cartoon, I think you've passed it. That's I, I'm willing to put my foot down on that. I think point. it's when you're yeah. making your income on it. Yeah. I would it's... argue I would argue that it's actually as a person who's watched literally every episode more often more than once, but has gr- in many ways have watched the growth, I would argue that there's a really interesting sort of like meta narrative of that when you go from campaign to campaign. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Campaign one was very was as close to a home game as it was. It was their home game characters. It was originally Path Pathfinder, like they did a lot of homebrew stuff. They figured out a way to make it work. They went all the way to level 20 because they just didn't want to let it go. you know. And then Campaign 2, the very few, first few episodes of Campaign 2, there was so much... Um, it's actually a little bit like cringy to watch in the sense of like everybody's trying something and they're all like trying to already have the sort of like years of interpersonal character narrative at the very beginning and like and it just wasn't it wasn't working um and it was also be- because there was a certain pressure to hit that mark yeah mm-hmm. right and then i would argue that campaign three uh by the end of campaign two they had figured out those characters but the way that campaign three has gone they uh have definitely jumped that proverbial shark that way right um in the sense that it feels much more like a product, that there are many more guest characters coming on, guest players coming on for like short stints in a way that is like that doesn't feel as organic as when Mary Elizabeth McGlynn is like, "Can I just can I still come?" You know, and like Will Fried- Will Friedel is like, "Yeah, I'll also just show up." This and is Pat just Rothfuss gonna be my Thursdays. Mails Marisha Ray a ring. <laughs> yeah, and Pat Ro- Pat Roth exactly like that he just you know. made. Um, yeah, I mean, I think cool. the the what. <laughs> I don't yeah. need to know anymore. I, that's just, ben, okay. ben and I are baffled. By all <laughs> but I think the, the point at which it turns is both a question of like, what is the point at which you are making decisions as a player or a GM for different reasons than you would in a home game, which is hard, which is like nebulous because like everyone has different. What is that yeah. criteria that they use about what decisions they make in character or whatever? But like often, I think it's like when. A, when are you taking what the audience will think into account in terms of, like, the decisions that you're making? And Mm. B, what is the point at which you start to care about the feedback that you are receiving and make adjustments in response to it? Because, in fact, one of the big reasons, too, that Critical Role has had so many guest characters and is doing so many... um, It's because they're all white. (laughs) and all that is... Yeah, it's because it's an all-white cast and so many people have said, this is a problem, uh, rightly so. Um, and that's their way of sort of trying to address it. But yeah, that's like, I think, I don't know. That's where I locate like where that turn. Which is. works better than totally. Travis McElroy playing a bisexual Latina uh, men at people <laughs> dream drill in um, Adventure Zone uh, Amnesty. What sucks is that Amnesty is my favorite Adventure Zone season, which is an unpopular opinion, but also yep. I do not like Aubrey Little very much. No, not at all. <laughs> no, that that was the point where I was like, oh, I don't think I can listen to this guy's voice anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I honestly my eyes turn red. <laughs> well, and I think that's also very interesting too. Like, not for nothing, not not to pivot to sort of McElroy uh, interpersonal dynamics or whatever, but the role of listening to 
listening to them all swap who's going to be the GM, right? Who's like who's running the game? Uh, cannot listen to Griffin as a player. He is far too disruptive and disrespectful to the person who's trying to tell us, trying to like, try, who's trying to world build, um, and is and in a way that it's like that feels different than the way that Travis does it, or that feels different than the way that Justin does it. Who, for my money, is perhaps the most respectful and the most sort of like consistently good player on that on that show, in that he is always sort of like playing in the world that they've agreed to to play within. Um, and is doing less at like just trying to like do a do a goof on their brother mm. in a way that is like mean spirited. You know what I mean? Um, but it, but like that's my personal like I hear the means. I don't like mean jokes. You know what I mean? I'm not particularly. They kind of turn me off. Well, it also it's as interesting an member. the the sort of thing that because what I'm pulling out of that is that like you find Justin a good player in an actual play because he is doing the thing that he is moving in the direction that everyone is going and he is attempting to like adhere to the world and the story that is happening while still making interesting choices and you know like making a talk making a, a wizard named taco taco i would also argue it's because he's good at his job right he yeah. is a good comedian who has good chemistry with the people he works with and yeah. it's that chemistry that lets him also be mean to them like and yeah. It, yeah it's fun when he does it because he knows how to do it because he's good at his job and i think coming at this from a different angle of like you know why is this a genre that people listen to at all mm. is yeah. i really only listen to actual plays when i like already know someone from yeah. them who is usually mm. an actor or a comedian who is good at their job um i mean yeah. you know like like critical role a show i haven't watched but like well, you know, stars Matthew Mercer, the voice of Levi in Attack on Titan, yeah, the voice yeah. of Ganondorf. Yes, people know who he is, <laughs> and people sort of know, oh, well, this guy, he could perform. And I think that's true of, of most shows, someone in them. You know, Rue Tales of Magic, like, I came to that show because Branson Reese was a cartoonist who I really liked, who had a really kind of twisted take on the world, and I knew that he would bring that to his own world building as a GM, and More that really interesting. That. Really, I started listening to Retails of Magic because Cohen Edenfield, who is the person on Twitter who wrote that tweet about how calling someone a clown is the most cutting insult, or calling saying who's this clown is the most cutting insult because not only are they a clown, they're not even a bet one of the better known clowns. Yeah. Um, I really like Cohen Edenfield, and Cohen Edenfield is like, Retails of Magic is really good. You should listen to it. I was like, bet. Um, and then I really liked it. And now I listen to a lot of. They stuff did one of the best that. guest spots in the most recent season. So good, so good. Yeah. Um, I should listen to Skull Tenders. Anyway, um, I'll oh, I have say, a, I have episodes downloaded to my phone. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I I'm we'll curious if we think. I've always had a theory, and I, I'm curious to see if what you all think of this because I, I just I mean, and maybe it's just me. That is not how I have ever gotten into any actual play. Um. The other think... way is through I want to listen to this particular system being played. That's usually um, how I've how I've done it, yeah. But I, I was going to ask a theory I have a theory about why people stick with actual plays. Um sure. that sort of goes to what Chris was talking about earlier about the sort of meta plot, but it's um, some cost fallacy. <laughs> I actually well, literally so honestly <laughs> yes. Sometimes sometimes I think that, but I also think back to Ben when we were working on Let's Play Play um back back in the days of your like that a was decade a or play that like I wrote that. about um Let's Plays uh around the time of GamerGate. Yeah. Mm. And I, when we were working on that, I remember somebody, I think it was Todd uh because I had no exposure to Let's Plays um as someone who does not go on youtube that often um was, i think it was todd but it might have been you said something about like the appeal of let's plays is that you know it the good ones it feels like you're sitting on the couch with a buddy uh watching them play a video game and i've always wondered if that is sort of the secret sauce in the really successful actual oh, yeah. plays is that like that is almost certainly the appeal of watching dimension 20 right like you can get in, parasocial with these famous people or, or you know talented yeah people yeah i was gonna say so in, yeah. in many oh, ways yeah. the appeal is for all that the like stories and characters and so on are great in many ways the thing that i i feel like people keep tuning in for is the like 
narrative of the ongoing friendship and camaraderie of these people <laughs> these like yeah. you know, three to six uh people who form the core cast of most let's plays or of most uh, actual plays um and usually doesn't change very much friendship oh. and i would also say like you know screen or audio chemistry right yeah. which sometimes yes. feels like friendship and yeah. isn't necessarily <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely i mean yeah. a big part of the appeal of like watching all of dimension 20 is watching the the group that is the intrepid heroes who are like the main cast of dimension 20 like grow over time and become closer friends like this most recent season of fantasy high that's airing as we record this uh has so many inside jokes from just their like friendship in a way that it seems like they tried to avoid earlier on. And that that evolution is interesting. Mm -hmm. That's also a tangent. But I think it's, I think part of it is like, there's a rewarding, it feels rewarding, right. In that regard to be in on a joke, right. Mm -hmm. You like, we like being in on a joke. It's fun. And so, or like, or like having that understanding and like calling back, there is a certain element of just like hitting that nostalgia, serotonin or dopamine or whatever the one is um because like i remember that character from campaign one and it's so cool that here they are again in campaign three mm -hmm. you know like oh cool and i think what i think and i think it, that sort of touches on the larger conversation about context right we're looking at especially when you're looking at a core group of human beings who play who are friends who interact with each other on a regular basis through that like on that friendship through different directions mm -hmm. right because these characters that we all that we all create as players of these games are all there's always like you know it's an aspect of ourselves and no matter what whether we want it to be or not and i think that it's very interesting to watch i don't know Percy and i've had this conversation on a number of occasions but just like thinking just like the uh archetypical like play styles of different people you know and like the very, f the, uh, the very famous version of this is Jester Lavor, Laura, Laura Bailey's character, little, her little blue tiefling, who talks like this, hello, I am Jester. <laughs> She's very, like, you see her, Ginny, Di Ginny D or Di or whatever, like, does a, does a cosplay. It's very, very, it's like So the Andy chaos. Kaufman taxi character? <laughs> yes. It's, honestly, she's so cute. It's really, and she's a little ball of chaos. And it's a, but it's a really big departure in play style yeah. from her very serious Vexalia in campaign one, right? Her very sort of like serious brooding sort of like, you know, I'll wink at you and get what I want, darling, sort of like, you know, character to jump into that, right? To go that far and to be interacting with the same group of people from a different perspective um, is really, really interesting. You know, it's interesting to see how does her husband who is also a player at the table handle this this version of his of his wife you know like but to just to put one just to give a one single connection there i just think it's interesting that because i absolutely agree with what we we're saying that like it is the group of people and their chemistry and their relationship that i feel invested in yeah but also i don't like the framing of like we're just friends playing a game as like a reason for doing a show and I'm feeling like some tension there and I don't know how to like reconcile that within myself and my brain. Um, well, I, I think what Ben said earlier is a good, like it's, it's, it's about kind of performer chemistry, not, yeah. not necessarily like, like we can just packaging. remove the, I, I think there's usually a certain amount of performed friendship. Although I have also seen performed antagonism. I think one of uh. the, I think one of the, Fun. Which can be great, but can Which, be very grating, yeah. Right, yeah, like, it's it, you either love it or you hate it, and it might depend on the performer's, like, ability with it. I do think that's... I've noticed that in, um, like, D20-based uh, actual plays. You know, it's all... I think that's a big, easy, like, divide, is it's like, all right, is this a D20 actual play where the shtick is, like... The GM is cutthroat and like out to kill the players and has a performatively antagonistic relationship with them, or is it one where we're like, or is it one where the GM is a beleaguered sort of doormat and the players just kind of do whatever they want? Exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, two yeah. two flavors of I'm saying D20 because I've seen this in both like D and D and Pathfinder type games, yeah. and I think I think the structure of the game lends itself to that. I mean, um, I do. Yeah. I guess it is. I guess it is actually the admission that it is like you're doing a show 
versus like this is just a game that we would play like any other game if no one was listening. Although well, I think what you're talking about is Worlds Beyond Number, right? Which isn't, you know, like without <laughs> saying what you're saying. But like just just in general, uh, that but that doesn't uh, because that is probably the most like extreme version of this. But I think ultimately what we're talking about is marketing. You're talking yeah. about yeah. You're talking about I think there's a difference between we're just a bunch of friends do it playing a home game and we ha- who happen to be broadcasting it to you versus we are a group of friends broadcasting what is essentially our home game to you yeah and those are two those are two different things That's and true. often they are misconstrued i also think and, usually it's the former right like usually it is people just trying to make money <laughs> like yeah. at least now like i think yeah maybe 10 years well, ago now, yeah when it was starting up it was a little more like oh we were having fun playing a game so we decided to like play it for the public and make a little money and now it's okay we are a curated and cast series of performers who are doing a show but because of the origins of this version of the format feel sure. both obligated to and feel they will sell better if they pretend that it is well, I think, more of an organic and personal experience yeah. than and it I is think, a performance and i think part of that is the a reason that i think a lot of people watch actual play that i don't necessarily share anymore but i think is true for at least a lot of it because like i i'm not really like a, a a person who considers themselves like in fandom except when it comes to dimension 20 like i f- am very immersed in that fandom community and it seems to me most people not most i'm not gonna say most people a lot of people who watch dimension 20 and are really into dimension 20 are into dimension 20 because they don't have a home game they don't have people in their lives yes. that they can play D D with uh and instead they watch this show because it like scratches a similar itch for them and i think that that is interesting and it's also i think probably part of why the marketing of like this is our home game or like we are friends who are playing games together and we are sort of letting you into the room for that is appealing to um, people well, who don't have a lot of friends yes <laughs> well, i've got a lot of friends but not a lot of them who play and all those people in my life don't want to play you know what I mean? I have, mo- in fact, the, the, the people who are in my life the most actively don't like this and have never liked this. So, you know, like, it's a wonder that I'm on this podcast in a lot of ways because <laughs> I didn't have access to it. And that is exactly why I was watching it because I was like, this is so interesting. And there, that parasocial activity aspect of it, absolutely, like, I, 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 of course, like, I'm absolutely not immune to it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think and I think not to not to be targeted, but um, I think that the that response Ben is actually the problem of this discourse and the and broadly is the is like the sort of like instant judgment of people for doing these sorts of things and the judgment of like my de- my my dimension twenty is the best and critical role is crap or I don't watch any of the, anything that makes any money because they're all sellouts like at the end of the day. You know, and like it, it, that, that sort of like moralization of this whole conversation is probably where we end up having what, what holds this whole sort of like idea, this idea of this as a potential art form of storytelling back, right? Like, what makes 20 Sided Tavern bad? Well, is, you know, I, I like <laughs> it, nothing it, makes it bad morally. Right. Um, right. Check out no, Nick's no, article no, and makes... three views about Twenty Sided Tavern. Yes, I actually just the day I'm going to date us. The day of uh, of recording this, I published a, a moderately negative, I would say, review of three views. I as read this. Way less I'm nasty. Have to read it. I I was way less. I'll say I I did not have a great time at Twenty Sided Tavern, which, for the sake of posterity, is a currently running uh, branded sort of participatory D D actual play off broadway in new york city listen um, you already couldn't get me to go to stage 42 at gunpoint so <laughs> yeah i know right <laughs> well so i i i will say i think um well what i was about to say was i was way less uh nasty than the folks at rascal Rascal. (laughs) Um, i'm sure fucking eviscerated it well but but i do think here's here's the thing i do think look and and this is this is going to be specific to what i'm about to say is specific to the 20-sided tavern but not necessarily inapplicable to other um shows is that i think 
20 sided tavern makes up like sort of sells a lot of promises um mm-hmm. and you know kind of a lot you know the marketing talks about how like deeply participatory it all is and yada 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 um and it it's definitely a good time if you're like a D super fan um i say in the review but it was a seared in my brain experience like 30 seconds into the show the gm is like our show our story takes place on the sword coast in the city of Waterdeep, and the person sitting behind me gasped with delight <laughs> and i was like I, oh <sighs> i just i'm in the wrong place because i simply do not have that relationship with water with water deep yeah um, but but it is um you know to the extent if, if we're going to take this seriously as an art form um then art says things well, <laughs> you know like yeah. like like that's a double-edged sword it's like if we're gonna say actual plays are art which i think they are then they you know then then they embody and articulate content to me what 20 side tavern articulated was a sort of like very surface level most yeah. of the participation is like mashing a button on your phone on an app that works sort of well um and so to me it's like i i don't know what I remember sending Percy a text midway through where I was like, I'm trying to figure out if game systems, um, you know, if, if game systems uh, embody ideas, what what ideas are embodied by like frenetic, like <laughs> high intensity, but ultimately extraordinarily low impact and uninformed because they give you no information about what you're like choosing usually yeah. when you're choosing between mm. options like what values are embodied by like that kind of participation <laughs> um i mean i, I think I these know. shows also often look down on their audiences which which make them worse art right, right i i think yeah. for 20 sided tavern like one of the reasons i didn't go other than the fact that you couldn't get me to go to stage 42 at gunpoint <laughs> is reading the marketing for that show it was about a hundred words explaining what actual play was badly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yes. uh, if I didn't yes. know what it was, I'd be like, what, what, what happens on stage here? It doesn't give me any idea of like what kind of crazy characters I'm going to meet, what kind of scenario they're going to be in, what kind of story is going to get told. It's, like, sell, it's selling actual, it on like, moment to moment. It's selling it on improv. It's, it's selling it as an improv show, which is like not. And audience interaction. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was going to say, I think it's, it sells mainly the idea of audience interaction, which it then doesn't really live up to that much. Again, I, I found the interaction, you know, is on a very sh- kind of shallow level. Um, and I would say it also, like, it does look down on its audience. One of the most, like, infuriating moments to me of that show was there were a couple of, there were a couple of moments where audience members would work together to solve a puzzle. Um, oh. And the, and the GM and the, the, there's another performer who is the quote unquote tavern keeper who's basically live running all of the projections so that they go on the right choose your own adventure path uh both the gm and the tavern keeper often were sort of like oh just, guys turn that into sort of an open book quiz there or whatever um and i was like this is a weird thing to do like that response is yeah. weird to people mm-hmm. who are a having fun b in one case we're told to participate with nearby people because you split the yes. clues up among different sections of the audience but i guess we spread the participation too far and somehow that yeah. crossed the because line. Because I was yelling, because I yell, yelled to the other people like, it's this one. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like, like somehow that cro- I I was supposed to turn around to the people like Pretty immediately to, around yeah. me, which is one of the few like uses of the phone app I actually liked as a mechanic. I was like, oh, how cool. Kind of I have to like interact with the people around me to solve this puzzle. And then people were yelling them out and they were like, how dare you do that? Uh, it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, and... Yeah, so yeah, I, I would agree. It it does look down on its audience, um, and it and it doesn't understand what it's saying or why, right? You know, because in the ending, my audience got nominally, uh, the nominally the the message to the extent that there was one was a very sort of like bland D and D ish message of like you know people can come together to solve problems. Ours, like, is yours. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, well, it's insane to have that be the ending of your show, and then midway through the show, be like, "Don't work do together." That. She did. By, was like, there like a character arc? Yeah, like 
<laughs> like what? <laughs> like it, it, there's just a lack of critical thought about oh. what the shows mean. And well, we've spent too long on Twenty Side Tavern, so we should move back. But, to but I want to. But I do want to say. I do want to say as a counterweight to that. Right. Mm-hmm. A great example of this is the Exu Calamity. Right. Mm-hmm. Just as a, a, a very limited actual play that used critical role like world building and lore and many of their players, but also like there was a significant Dimension 20 crossover there. But they very explicitly said, we are doing a tragedy. We and are our characters this. are going to die. <laughs> it's not going, they're not going to survive. You know, like this is, yeah. this is a tragedy. So how do you do an actual play? where you know it's a tragedy. And that is a conceit that the audience understood from the very beginning and allowed for. And in many ways, what is this? And the production design supported it in many, many, many ways, including like the Twitch overlay. Uh, EXE Calamity, I would argue, is the best actual play I've ever seen. Um, The Twitch overlay, as you go from episode to episode, slowly like crumbles. Um, the like map design, like all of the elements, um, contribute to the, to the, like it is, it is an incredibly specific and focused produced thing. And I find I often gravitate to actual plays that are super produced in that way, because I think of what you're saying, Nick, of like, they have a thing that they're trying to do and I'm interested in what that thing is. Um, and sometimes that thing might be, we're trying to figure out how to play this game and I might not hang on to the show for as long because I'm often much more interested in like what uh, what dynamics are there between the performers in telling a particular story or exploring a particular idea. Yeah. Not that we at this podcast ever produce anything that's we're just trying to figure out this game as an actual. Literally, <laughs> I listen. I am a hypocrite. <laughs> what do you want? I, I, would, I would argue that we have had pretty deliberate reasons for producing all of the games that we've produced even though most of them have also been like we want to explore the system as system yeah we've well and i think the i think that i know i think i think the gms also will often come in and be like i have this is a thing that i'm trying to do uh like here is my here is my story or here is my thing well but i think that's that's the end point right is that we are all theater artists Yes, and we are people who have a uh, certain set of skills and tools <laughs> mm. that we have learned uh, from a combination of schooling and experience that <laughs> we use to tell stories, right? Like that yeah. we use to do performance, yes. and so that's True. the way that this show is going to work is because it's people coming from that side of things. Some people are coming from film, like the people in Critical Role. I think like they're they're mostly like film TV people, voice act- all voice well, actors, all voice over, actors, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like you you have comedians like the McElroys, you have various you you have cartoonists like Branson Reese and Chris Hastings yeah. and and Ali Fisher from Root Tales. So it's it they're all coming from like slightly different methods of doing this. You know, the the same thing which is uh performing, telling a story. I will say to pivot us into brief discussion of one of Ben's questions about um, improv is that I did see a tweet one time that I thought was incredibly funny because someone was like what if we um, did a TTRPG actual play podcast except we didn't play a game we just role played and I was like babe that's just doing improv (laughs) yeah yeah and this is an improv podcast (laughs) improv which also has rules like if you're gonna do an improv show you're probably going to be doing it in a certain style, doing a doing a herald is akin to playing a TTRPG. I would argue. Yeah, sure, absolutely. But I do think it's interesting to think about because I was I was just to what you're saying, Ben, of like, oh, all these people are performers, you know, who who sort of move into actual play. But I think that's I think that's starting to become less true. I do think there's as actual play has exploded, um, there's a whole network of people most of whom i don't think are making particularly much money if any at this but nonetheless a network of like people who are on multiple actual plays some long running some with kind of significant fan bases who you know i would say like on some level you are a working performer 
then. Uh, but whose primary performance, like experience and training, is tabletop role playing game hmm. actual plays. Uh, yeah, these are I've, you know all yeah. people much younger than everyone on this podcast. I think, um, but I've just seen yeah. a few. Of, I can name a few people who are. I think. Well, I feel like Abrea Abrea Iyengar is is one of those. Abrea was a jock. Abrea's not a like Abrea oh, was. Not, I don't like, know that. Yeah, about her. but there's She's also an asshole player. Yeah, yeah. Well, who's the, other, who's the other guy? There was an NFL player who uh, now runs like a D and D thing. He like was playing in the. Oh, I'm trying to remember his name. He was on a. He was on a. Um, uh, oh, he was on Stream of Many Eyes. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah. there's also you're right. concurrent with that though, as like there's also a growing like, for lack of a better word, like theatricalization of like there. Mm-hmm. Something that I think is really interesting is that um the show Transplaner. Um, which is a trans, all trans, uh, POC led um, actual play show, has a dramaturg who, like, their title is dramaturg. They are like an active working dramaturg. Their name is C. Thomas. C's very cool. Um, but it's fascinating to me that dramaturg is becoming a word that is used very often in tabletop uh, actual play spaces because there is a recognition of, like, oh, we need to be telling an intentional story with care towards. Um, making space for discovery and improvisation and things to happen at the table the way that like is a major affordance of playing a TTRPG as opposed to um, a, doing a scripted story while also like intentionally making a piece of art, you know? I would argue, I mean, yeah, yeah I'm thinking about Danny Carr, the lore, map, lore keeper of Critical Role and what's, uh, what's her name? Lore, it's lore keeper at Dimension 20 as well. And I would argue that perhaps that is the threshold right there when you're going from a st- like that is the that is the like mark of like maybe a responsible threshold but the, the responsible mark of the threshold but it, that is the threshold right where you're going like this is a home game versus there's we enough have an here. employee <laughs> right. oh, well yeah. True. Yeah, yeah i mean yeah not for nothing right like yeah and so and look how do uh, you could go into say anytime you gm a gm list game you know when you're introducing it to a bunch of people you're also a little bit of an employee too but like yeah you know but like but at a, but but i think in general like that's kind of it right they have an employee whose job it is to know the lore to help keep people on track to remind people of like what's in canon and what they've already done so that they can you know, use only use that. Well, which is also and so the audience creating. won't get mad at them because the audience listens better than they do sometimes. <laughs> well, and is, and is also like sure. that person is meaningfully separated as an audience member as opposed to a participant. Yeah, yeah. Um, like it is, it is a situation in which you have a, a a a person who is not one of you at the table who cares enough to about what is happening to document. <laughs> the story and make a wiki or you know whatever like it is it is an investment of somebody who is not actively involved Hmm. this is making me wonder what the difference is between a director and a dramaturg in a theater now but i understand but you know there's you know that's not for this podcast that's a conversation (laughs) Uh, director creates staging that's the main difference yeah as someone in the director's union (laughs) As a yeah. dramaturg, I, I don't should get in that. that. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's they're great. I like them a lot. <laughs> what I wonder is, what do we feel? Because you know, we've talked about a number of different sort of kinds of actual play shows, and it, ones that are built from different kinds of performers for different purposes. What do we feel are the building blocks and general guidelines for making actual play actually good to listen to? Um, wow. Sort of. You know, are there rules that usually make sense to follow for actually making it into a show or that could be broken in a fun way? Um, what is an episode and how do you sort of de- define that as you are playing? Like, do you pre decide how long it's going to be or that you are going to try to hit points? There's, there's, there's many ways to think about this, but like, how do you make a show a show? Mm-hmm. I think that, um, one of the main factors is the thing you mentioned before about table like table chemistry um i feel like that's very crucial um i also sometimes think there are sort of i i've never sat down and tried to write this out but i do often think that there are sort of archetypes of uh tabletop actual play 
the pirate, like, the robot, and the ninja over here? Is that what you're doing? You go the improv, <laughs> the improv uh, archetypes? Oh, I don't know. I don't know those archetypes. No, I no. I was thinking there's like there's almost characters of actual play players. Mm-hmm. You know, I mentioned before the like antagonistic GM or the like doormat gm those are sort of two gm yeah. archetypes but then i'm like many actual plays have a like chaos gremlin many that, actual yes. plays have like the stable or Allie straight Beardsley. person <laughs> what tim plot or ali beardsley to only bring it have to... only yeah yes many many have the sort of neophyte um at least is a neophyte at the beginning but like somebody who's part of whose role on the show is to ask questions clint to mcelroy be. clint mcelroy yeah. i Ashley i Johnson. jake um herwitz yeah Allie um Beardsley. Allie Beardsley. <laughs> i feel like i feel like there's probably more archetypes too but i do think it's safe to say that like sure you there's know, the rules lawyer there's the you've got the bright murphy you've got the liam liam o'brien you know you've got, yeah you've also got the sort of like you've got the quiet assassin exactly right like you know you've got uh, uh zako yama gonna come in and be quiet for almost the entire game and then like figure it out with one line the you know hype I mean? man i feel like that's another one you see that's lou wilson often. right there like we're just going to dimension 20 but like you're absolutely right and like i think that there is but i don't know that that's necessarily unique to actual play i think that's just on, that's that's ensemble <laughs> Yes. Well, right. No, I mean, absolutely. I think you put together but... an ensemble. How does that ensemble make a listenable actual play using mm-hmm. both their own sort of personal archetypes that we've just defined, as well as the tools of making audio or video? I mean, sure. I think there has to be like a self awareness of like you're making a show. Like, yeah. and this is my like. I think there has to be a sense of like, oh, I I have to accept about myself that I uh, am a Brian Murphy type um at the table and we have to you you have to assemble an ensemble with the understanding of who you all are and whether those are compatible things i think yeah. is mm-hmm. one of them which it requires self-awareness and sort of acknowledgement of like okay what are we all sort of bringing and does that create interesting dynamics and again this is not new i've i've talked to improv people before who have told me that is exactly how they work you know they're sort of like you know it's like there's the characters i play in the improvisations there is also i'm just going to use myself as an example like there's also nick the character version of myself that i play in the bits between the improvs when we're like talking to the audience or whatever that is like a you know that is me but is a like slightly heightened version of myself right um because it's not just me as I would be at home. It's me in a way that is more like entertaining and bounces off my cast, my ensemble members in particular ways. Well, it's um, it's the yeah. hey, you're on exactly you're on. Yeah, it's being on, and it's also the choice to not be like Travis McElroy and antagonize your brother because it's fun to antagonize your little brother while you're trying to do a podcast. You know, right? Well, or that it, has it, to be the bit, and it has to be really well executed. Yeah. You have to be able to have a good interplay between the people you are interacting with. But if I think it's also, antagonistic, they have to be able to take it and then dish it yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think I think what we're kind of coming around to is all those things are great, you know, and those like sort of the interpersonal aspects of it, but like what are the kinds of moves that these people make? Right? Because yeah. these are moves. And you think about in improv, they call them moves. Same thing. Like what's the move you made? And it's the same thing in D&D. Emily Axford making a choice is not going to be the same as Allie Beardsley making a wild choice and being like, I got a 5% chance to make it and it might just be awesome, right? Yeah. Versus like someone who's going to keep the narrative going versus, it, like, versus someone who's going to stumble into something by accident, you know? I think, I think for our audiences, the, uh, I think our Brindle, you mentioned Brindle with Bay before, but that was a really well-crafted ensemble of four very different kinds of players mm-hmm. who were able to work very well together and like balance and bounce off of each other's strengths you yeah. know in the, in a very similar way you know yeah and i think there has to be a sort of in, hand in hand with this like ensemble that like can all move in the same direction but isn't doing it the same way because like four yes. people doing the same thing isn't interesting i also think there has to be some degree of agreement about um 
approach in the sense of like how adherent do we feel we have to be to the rules um like how hand wavy do we feel like we want to be like branson reese doesn't give a fuck about the rules of D D 5e um nope well it makes breaking them part of that's his, the yeah, show that's part of the, yeah like, like i a considered part of the show i would i would argue i yeah hot roddy is my favorite npc in retails of magic and he is a bully mancer which is a magic that does not exist in D 5e and either. has no rules behind it it, it just, has no rules. yeah it, um but I yeah like I th- I think you also have to sit down and make some decisions about um the balance of we are doing improv versus we are playing a game adherently to the game system we are replicating the experience of playing a tabletop role playing game versus we are creating a show to be listened to and yep. I think those things are distinct from one another but they don't have to be like mutually exclusive i think also from a narrative perspective you have a lot of gms who will come in with pre-written monologues very carefully crafted world building sort of settings that are creative and novelistic and they bring those in as things where it's like i'm going to talk for a while (laughs) in a kind of semi-prepared way at least Mm -hmm. and that's a jumping off point for the more improvisational parts of it yeah and i think that that's also like you know you can do that in a home game but i think generally you find when you get sort of like a ganon reedy and neoscum making the denver cube denver colorado has become kowloon 2 and all the buildings are so high that the whole thing is a cube, a wall-to-wall cube of buildings. And it's this incredible dystopian uh, environment, which itself tells a story. And then when you've gotten like what it is visually and physically, then suddenly you have a different kind of game session in there. And th- like the players reacting to that environment is entertaining. Mm-hmm. So what we're talking about is having a good GM or a good understanding within the players when there is no GM of what that a GM would do. Yeah, that's right? actually that's something that I've been learning a lot from us playing Our Haunt, um, soon to be released. Is very because that's a GMless game that I'm facilitating in a lot of ways, and it's been really really interesting to see the evolution of the ensemble over time in terms of like who feels comfortable taking ownership of certain things, who is comfortable leading, like what, what is the sort of balance of all of that? But yes, you absolutely have to have somebody who is in charge in some way, at least in terms of like structuring the show, because the show has a to be structure. A director. Not for nothing. A director. I will say as well, this is my one sort of softball pitch for what I don't do, which is produce a like long long form actual play <laughs> uh, um, but i do think that um in terms of what i've listened to i i think that non d20 systems offer the cast more tools for that particularly like powered by the apocalypse and fortune in the dark systems in which i'd include like the card from brindlewood stuff because those are games that were designed pretty specifically to like let players emulate <laughs> narrative flows um you know that yeah. would I, I mean some of the like monster the, uh sorry um uh fuck um monster hearts yeah is yeah. literally a session is an episode of a tv show like a monster TV show that teens would watch. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Blades in the Dark uses the same language. I mean, yeah. So, so is Brindlewood Bay. Not that that's how we played it, but that is actually what they wanted. <laughs> well, and, and yeah. yeah. And I, well, and I think also there is an element of like, as much as we're all theater people, I think there is an element of like the cinematic works stylistically really well in actual play. Yes. That I've seen. Um, Cause like you have things like Critical Role that are just four hours of sort of uncut footage that happens but there's also all of these really tightly edited things where being able to jump around and manage the spotlight in a specific way using game systems like brindlewood bay is like advantageous and works really well i find i just want to i just want to throw out there that i know we don't do any things but i I think i i'm very based off of all this conversation and sort of like what it seems like we're all excited about this is why i'm excited about the dagger heart system that spencer stark has created with with critical role 
is because it is sort of like it feels like a vi- what they're going for is that happy medium from what we're all talking about which is uh using sort of like a 2d12 system and you take the like you're always rolling quote unquote with advantage or whatever you're, cho- you're choosing the higher number but there's an association between like one of the D- d12s represents hope and one represents fear and the if whichever the higher roll is is the one you take so you take i got a 12 with fear or 15 with fear whatever um offers the gm a like tangible narrative strength as a result of it versus hope which is you get a tangible strength so every role that you're doing whether it's like i want to i want to see if that guy over there is the person i'm looking for or <laughs> or if it's i want to hit this monster like also contains a narrative weight associated to it with tangible like resource spendable resource that comes with it i'm like this is this i think there's some very interesting stuff happening with this that it's not out it's not official so you yet. always succeed but, but when you succeed sometimes you fail no you can fail you can fail you well like, you have uh, to get two su- bad rolls succeeding in sure. succeeding it's with harder. hope succeeding with hope is different than succeeding with fear and failing with hope is different than failing with fear mm. right like and that's just narratively speaking you know like mm. and not only is that int- is that change it narratively you also gain this like tangible currency either hope like that that goes in, that is played like with moves associated with especially combat yeah. and stuff it's a very in- I, i'm curious i'm really curious to see it i hope that it uh finishes so we can play it on the on the on the pod at some point well, I think it's this, you know. Well, what you're pointing to, I think, there, Chris, that is why I would recommend like non D twenty systems for right. uh, uh, actual plays. Although you lose the branding advantage, which is significant. <laughs> sure. uh, but um, it, is that in in like a Powered by the Apocalypse game, there is no dead moves um, because of the structure. Yes. You know, you what you don't get is what happened to us in our game of D&D way back yeah. in season one, where our climactic fight, there was a long stretch of time where it felt very long to me as a player, it was long. where because the mechanics yeah. are symmetrical, it was like, we were all just having shitty dice luck. So the players were swinging and missing a bunch. And then the monster was also swinging and missing a bunch and nothing happened. And yeah. in the, in the sort it of, it wasn't that long. By the that's way, good I, to know. It oh, felt that's good to know. The one person you're not in that. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. It felt enormously long as a player, but but that can happen in D and D or in in any D twenty game, right? Where where you have the kind of symmetrical mechanics, and that's the thing that that was sort of the apocalypse world innovation was like the GM doesn't roll dice. So when you say I'm going to do something like either you do it or you fail, but failure isn't like it doesn't happen. Failure well, is yeah. there's a narrative like event yes. that happens. But also um, of note, well, many and I think people, that's the thing. That... Many people who play D and D five E in actual plays just don't follow the rules that closely. <laughs> but, but I think that's why, because yeah. like, because the rules don't lend themselves to cinematic storytelling. The rules lend themselves to like simulationist well, war game. There was a lot of discourse yeah. recently about a thing that Brendan Lee Mulligan said in a fireside chat for an episode of Worlds Beyond Number, where they were talking about combat in D and D five E. Because there was like a listener question about like why do you guys not do that much combat when like so much of D and D five E is like about that and he made some kind of they were making some why do you kitchen. guys not play this game they were making some kind of kitchen allegedly metaphor play. and it was it was like a whole thing that i don't necessarily feel like recounting yeah. at this moment in time but i was interested i was like oh it is very interesting to me that i'm like you, you could just admit that you're not really playing D D 5e that closely and like that's okay <laughs> That's, right. Yeah. Like, I mean, fine. I think also there's there, this desire, and this is maybe best shown in um, the uh, Adventure Zone Balance fight, where uh, Travis McElroy obviously lies on his rolls to uh, like yeah. jump out of a train over a ravine yeah. and like kill some monster on the. Wait, top did of the he train. obviously lie? Is that a real? Is that a so thing? obvious. Oh yeah, he absolutely uh, <laughs> lied. He later some, admits people to have it. put together uh, charts of his die rolls, and um, it's impossible. Uh, it, it, uh, it is effectively impossible. The uh, numbers he got. David's not listening to this. He's a liar. Um, <laughs> but the thing was, because the game basically doesn't let you do something crazy like that without just dying. It 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 didn't work for creating good audio. Right. And yeah. the thing that they blundered in going towards was well you just win <laughs> like yeah. we'll cheat and you just win rather than finding a way for the audio to well when you fail 
you don't win, but you don't like instantly die in mm -hmm. an uninteresting way. Like, okay, now you're hanging off the train and you have to climb up a rope. Ooh, the wall's coming. It, oh, you've hit the wall. Now you're like grabbing on the wall and you have to chase the train on a, a mine cart that's right there. Yeah. You can do improv things that actually work that yeah. keep the flow going and keep the performers in play. I will say pivoting a little bit to like the experience of like creating actual play, performing an actual play, which all of us have done many times on this very big cast uh, is that like, it's, I find it really honestly kind of taxing to GM for actual play because you are thinking so hard about the audience facing elements of it. And particularly this question that Ben has raised about like, what is a quote unquote episode? What belongs in an episode? Because we found on the show that it does not often work to say, this one hour chunk of time will be an episode because often you hit that point and you're like, oh, well, like, I guess we get, I guess we get out of here, but that doesn't feel like you want a button or you want to hit a certain story beat. Like, um, our, our haunt recordings, as Nick can attest to, have gotten crazy because we'll just like do 45 minute long scenes and it's like, okay. <laughs> I, I just listened to one earlier today where you all were like, hmm, should we cut here? No, we want to do like one more, one more <laughs> moment. And there was an hour and 10 minutes left on the, oh, <laughs> the yeah. track. Like, it, and like, admittedly, like the style, I think has to be specific to each game and each thing yes. that you're producing. But it, it like, it's, I find it as a GM really, really taxing to think about that and to be intentional about that, particularly if you're leaving a lot of space for like, letting things evolve in the moment you don't have a ton of beats planned out like dimension 20 especially early seasons very much structured by the fact that they were going to alternate a battle episode a role play episode over and over again and they have battle sets yeah. that have already been created that rick perry has made that they so they have to d arrive at that story beat somehow because yeah. they have the map made already um yeah so I, yeah yeah it's like hard to think about did your did your did your 20-sided tavern go over time? I don't... They didn't comment on it if it did. Mine did. 30 minutes. Ooh. Wow. Yeah, no, not that much over time. I don't remember what Again. the... I don't I don't remember what the, like, official runtime was, but it... What did what you say? 90 minutes. Oh, the Rascal Review definitely says it was, like, two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, no, I they was going to say, when I saw it... it what, did you see it in previews? Yeah. Okay, I think when I saw it, they had updated the runtime and said two hours, but it's fuzzy and might be a little longer. <laughs> Which Good, that, but that also feels that appropriate for that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, no. When when I saw it, it was it was like a little over two hours. I think it may, I think that tracks. You know what I mean? Like what we're talking about is where at the end of the day we are looking for where it is an improvised medium, right? Where we're looking for narrative catharsis to justify the ending of an episode that's not that's not a fixed target and like it it kind of can't ever if it ever becomes a fixed target then it stops being what it is right which is an improvised medium mm -hmm. you know and so i think that's sort of like i think that's always going to be part of it frankly you know, I mean, I also know on this show, too. we don't cut out a lot, right? We no. we cut out very little other than, like, you know, throat clearing and long pauses. I think that's a, that's a that was a specific choice on yeah. your part as producers to, to keep that in. I think you can also easily cut huge swaths of audio out if it's, you know, for whatever reason not interesting. If it's reading rules that have already been read on the show or aren't really that important for the audience to understand what's going on mm -hmm. or if it's arguing over what to do and then you finally decide what to do and it's not that funny that conversation or even but like you can do that and that's okay you one don't of have the, to one of the reasons that i really liked root tales of magic's first episode when i started listening to the the show their very first um campaign is because they cut almost all of the mechanics out of it um, which is admittedly a stylistic choice that not everybody likes, but I was like, oh, this is so cinematic. It feels like audio fiction, but it's also very clearly improvised and fun 
and I'm really into this dynamic. And because the show doesn't care about the rules, like I have permission to not care about the rules. And in fact, because you don't care about the rules, it's great for me that like even in like fights and stuff and they like I think leave more of it in later on as you go through the show. But like yeah. like fully like they cut out so much and it like it objectively doesn't make sense if you're trying to understand it as like D&D combat because it isn't trying to be. Right. Th rather than hitting like hit point numbers, they're trying to hit story beats within the combat, which works. It, sometimes yeah. it doesn't work. Usually it does. For a long time, they would even cut out like the results of die rolls. Like the uh, like yeah. Branson would be like, roll an athletics check. And then they would just like say what happened. And you're like, and it trains you to stop caring about what the number means. Good. Have you all listened to Midst? No. no. Midst? The game? Midst. M-I-D-S-T. It is a podcast that uh, it's very interesting has like in taken capacity. under their wing. Yeah, so it's an existing audio narrative podcast that was sort of like semi-improvised three unreliable narrators telling the same story. Mm. Um, the audio production on it is great. It's really, really good. And, uh, and then, yes, Critical Role sort of like put it under their umbrella for, for season two and now season three. They did it's need really. It. It's really fascinating. Well, I think, honestly, like, that's good. That's what they should be doing. They should be, like, trying to elevate other people. I think it's very interesting to think about. And, like, you know, in the, uh, when we do this, this conversation again in four years, um, I, would be, I would love to hear what people think about that and if that is considered a TTRPG, you know, uh, because there are clearly some sort of, like, unspoken rules that they are playing, that they are, the narrators are playing with. Um, but a la Rude Hills of Magic, we're not privy to them. It's mm -hmm. just a narrative, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like a very interesting sort of conversation when you go, all right, so when does it, when is it a, an actual play? And when does it just become sort of like Structured a fic improv. an audio drama? Yeah. yeah. Any closing thoughts on our sort of meandering conversation on actual play to TRPG <laughs> shows? I think... <laughs> <laughs> well, I am, I might bleep that one. <laughs> <laughs> does anyone want to give a real answer to that? Yeah, I think actual plays. It? Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I think actual plays are great. I think actual plays are great, and I love how different they are, and I love how they're striving for something that we don't yet know what it is. And I think that's that's perhaps the most interesting thing about actual plays as an art form is that I don't think anybody really has an answer as to what a good one is yet. Um. We just know what, because popular does not necessarily equate to good, right? Um, so I'm excited by the sort of like burgeoning art form that it is. Riffing on that a little bit, just something that ran through my mind earlier. I think treating it as an art form is very exciting to me. And um, the, and I think that the, way to think of it as an art form is to make sure we're not thinking of it as a genre but as i hope something that could contain you know many genres less a medium a medium yeah less film noir and more close closer to just like film <laughs> yeah yep. i would agree yeah i think it really matters the shows that I find most successful are the ones that think about what the affordances of TTRPGs as a medium are and think about, like, what does it mean to, uh, what does it, what does it mean to make those into performance that is consumable by others? Um, I think also they, they've reached a point where the median of actual play is now about the median where celebrity podcasts are, i.e. it's people you want to listen to doing something relatively interesting for about an hour to two hours. Mm. And that's not good art. That is just, that is capital C content, uh, which mm -hmm. I hate. Um, but I think that they do, and you know, I've listened to a couple actual plays that actually do reach some sort of artistic zenith of like, this was really good. And they're the ones that have a combination of a GM who is creating a world that's genuinely interesting to them and in sort of a either a science fiction-y or just a good book way. Oh, that's a cool place. Alongside really good performers who have kind of a character arc in mind that they work towards over a very long time, uh, but actually do move towards rather than just sort of jerking all at once. And mm -hmm. I think that's... It's, it, that's where you get the good meat of it.
Mm-hmm. Exu calamity. I mean, yeah. <laughs> truly, would... the two. I know that. I know that two of you haven't have, haven't watched it. Honestly, it's so good. It's great. It's a good one. Yeah, it's and I think it might. I I think even even knowing your sort of like proclivities, uh, I'd be very surprised if it was if you really truly gave it a chance. If you if you weren't if you didn't get to that last episode and look at the incredibly long lo- runtime of it oh, cool. and not go, I'm going to make time for this. It even is, if it I is like seven it. hours long. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Were they allowed to eat and pee? <laughs> oh, of course. Or were they like locked in a <laughs> no, locked they, in a they cage definitely, around the table? They definitely just... <laughs> they had IVs and diapers. <laughs> uh, it's but like truly, but and, and that may be the thing. I think right now, if I were to say, I know I said like we don't know what uh, what the good one is. To me, based off of all those things we said, that's the good one. Mm. So that's good. the that's the one that hits everything we're hit, we're talking about all at once i would say so. float city and neo scum mm. yeah i've been th- I, I, all right how about this I'll, you do you do exu and i'll start on neo scum and we'll reconvene i'd be very curious to hear your thoughts i have so many episodes of neo scum downloaded on my cellular device currently great it gets so fucking good dude I'm so <laughs> it's excited. so good oh is it one of those shows by season seven it's fantastic um <laughs> no i would say by like 20 episodes in, you're like oh i love these people i also i really love fun city um it made shadow run feel accessible to me which is a fucking feat yeah uh, i was gonna say no yeah. small feat there. no small feat <laughs> that's actually why i like float city is it's pretty short um and it gives you the really full picture of still fleet yeah exciting slay yeah well, with those recommendations, I think you know that's probably a pretty good place to leave it. Let's let's leave it on a <laughs> on a, a feeling of things that we love. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this month's episode of Dungeons and Drama Nerds. Thank you, Ben and Chris, for joining us for this Dark Time episode. We'll see you next month with another Dark Time episode. Dungeons and Drama Nerds is produced by Percival Hornack and Nicholas Orvis, and this episode was mixed and edited by Percival Hornack. Our core ensemble are Todd Brian Backus, Giovanni Camano, Anthony Sertaldine, Christopher Dierksen, Ben Ferber, Corey Flores, Mieko Gavia, Tess Huth, Romana Isabella, John John Johnson, CJ Linton, C. Meeks Meeker, Leo Mock, Dex Fahn, and Tristan B. Willis. If you'd like to help us continue exploring the intersections of theater and tabletop role-playing games, consider leaving us a review on your podcast app of choice or supporting us, and getting access to our patron-only bonus content, at patreon.com slash dungeonsanddramaners. You can find our social media and website links, including our cast bios, at the link tree in our show notes. And be sure to tune in soon for another episode of Dungeons and Drama Nerds. <laughs>